Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. This is the Band of Books podcast, episode 136. Six. Oh, I was I was going to guess that was right. Good. And as always, we are your Cinco de Mayo podcast connection for all things Lutheran. Christopher Gillespie on one end of the microphone. With two turntables? No, that was the last show. That was the last show. Dylan and Willen, Max and Relaxing. I mean, you can you can use two turntables and a microphone. I'm down with it. You know what? I found a box of LPs. I thought I had gotten rid of all my all my vinyl. Ooh, that's exciting. I sold my vinyl to go to Siberia. True story. <laughs> <laughs> and that was that, you know I thought okay it's done the fade's gone the fad's gone excuse me it's faded away right you know nobody's gonna get it in vinyl again I was. And it was right at the front end of and kind of the boom. you were wrong. I was wrong because I mean I sold I sold some pretty rare stuff and made made enough to go to Siberia, right? Right. Ran enough, so it was pretty good. The turntable was about half that. And now in hindsight, it was being like, hmm, I was kind of sick of moving it all because I had yeah, I think I had a total of sixteen, you know, twelve by twelve by fourteen boxes of LPs. Nice. So, yeah, yeah. So you know, a couple thousand and. Um, but each one of those boxes weighs about 50 pounds. Yeah, it's a and, lot to tote around. Yeah, yeah. I feel you. Store. I feel you. Yeah, so in hindsight, I kind of regret it, but only a little bit. Only. Most you of the time, I just like to push play and listen to music. And right. I know it's, it doesn't have the same tactile feel, but whatever. Anyways, for those of you who didn't already know, I'm Donovan Riley, mm-hmm. the murder hornet of Lutheranism. Thank you, China. Yeah once again giving us something that's going to kill us it's it's a uh, it's a different kind of warfare isn't it can we just shut down washington state and that whole supply line to china because that's they're two for two now COVID 19 and now murder hornets so. well maybe we'll see some domestic um you know drug production and all that kind of stuff right because we did it with oil and it worked that's true something like what is it 70 80 percent of our oil is domestic yeah i think so over 75 percent. isn't that crazy you just yeah. think like when we were growing up, it was all all come out of Arabia. OPEC. Yeah. Yeah. In my day, I remember the oil the OPEC oil rebellion. So it can it can be done. It's true. Yeah. Today, God willing, we'll stay on topic more than we have in the past several weeks. With the COVID, got the COVID fever. Got the quarantine fever. I think we're tired of it. Tired of which? The fever? <laughs> the COVID? Yeah, absolutely. We're totally tired of it. I mean, I've been sheltering at home for 48 days now, not going oh, out or I doing said, anything. I think I said five weeks in the sermon, and then I went back and I thought, oh, wait a minute. It hasn't been, it's been more than five weeks. Yeah. What is it, seven weeks, eight weeks now? I don't even know. Isn't it 47, 48 days? Yeah, how many weeks is that? Do the math. That's seven <laughs> weeks. Yeah. There's a reason we're pastors and not mathematologists. So, Luther. Luther. Luther is far more interesting than any of that conversation. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to, I guess, or at least it's a pleasant distraction. Pleasant distraction mm-hmm. defines things a little bit better for us, hopefully. We're going to jump forward to chapter two. And this is actually verse three in chapter two. If you're following along in the Camacho translation available through 1517, linked in the show notes, we are on page 66, verse three. Yet not even Titus, who's with me, was compelled to be circumcised. In this episode, and probably in the next episode, we are going to talk about this whole matter of the ministry to the circumcised and the uncircumcised, because I think, correct me if if you have a different opinion here, but it's kind of the subtext of the whole letter. It is, because there's the Judaizers there in Mm -hmm. the Church of Galatia. These are the guys saying, we have to go back and, you know, have our, oh, I don't know, our kosher Sabbath, and Mm -hmm. um, but it's worse than that. It's, you know, we got to talk about foreskins. Right. Well, these are disciples of James, mm, yeah, who came up from Jerusalem specifically for the purpose of preaching the correct gospel to the Galatians. It is kind of a weird thing that relationship of tradition to uh, mm-hmm. to doctrine, and you know the way that even amongst the apostles that that tradition had this right mm, powerful effect upon you know practice more than the, than the doctrine did. Yeah, never seen that before. Mm, no, I, yeah, it's just un, unfamiliar to foreign, me. Foreign, <laughs> foreign. We were talking about this. We come, we come back to church, and it's like, are we just going to go back to the things we were doing since we've already kind of changed now? I'm right. Like, oh, well, I, we probably will because it's like the comfortable thing. So, hey. Right. I mean, getting circumcised probably wasn't all that terribly comfortable, but, you know, that's what we did. Tradition. Yeah, so we'll just keep it's doing tradition. it. Yeah, it's what we did. Exactly, it's what we do. And 
maybe that's at the root of a lot of conflict then because I can also cite the Jerusalem Council right. in the Book of Acts. It seems at the end of the Jerusalem Council that everything had been smoothed out, specifically between Paul and some of the pillars in Jerusalem, as they were called. And yet, in this letter to the Galatians, we find out that essentially, like in Deadpool 2, <laughs> James and Paul just said, let's agree to disagree, I'm right. It's a family movie. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, <laughs> and as a consequence, you walk, if, if the New Testament ended with the book of Acts, yeah. we would assume that things were pretty status quo with the disciples and the apostles and everything that was going on with the ministry of the church. Mm -hmm. Then you read the letter to the Galatians and it's, oh, yeah. Oh, this is just like a regular meeting. <laughs> yeah. Luke paints a, a little bit of a rosy picture there mm -hmm. as far as that relationship, that inner dynamic between, um, well, I mean, Paul is, what does he say? He's untimely born. Yeah. He doesn't really belong. He's, they've, I can understand the skepticism. And they treat him like it, apparently. Well, it, you think, I mean, he is an oppressor of the church. So he's, he, in a sense, he's probably worse than a tax collector to them. Right. Well, and I wonder too, though, and I think perhaps, because I've talked to people who have said it has given them a somewhat fatalistic view of the church reading the Jerusalem Council mm -hmm. and then reading Galatians, for example. Whereas for me, it's very encouraging as a pastor because I read it in an Ecclesiastes, Koheleth sort of way. Right. There's nothing new under the sun. It's always been this way. The disciples were jerks when they were with Jesus towards each other. Yeah. And then you read the book of Acts, you read how they treated Paul and Barnabas and others, and you go, oh, no, they're still jerks. They still think they're yeah. special. Well, I think Paul, Paul probably resonates with you because, you know, he's like the colloquy, you know, pastor who comes in the Missouri senator doesn't really, that too, yeah. doesn't have the credential. Um, it doesn't mean that he's not capable or even, even more capable. Well, and I think that's a third rail, though, is Paul's ministry to the Gentiles is so successful. Mm. There's that animosity. Plus, I think there's a little bit of, well, Paul's bringing money back constantly for the church in Jerusalem. That's right. That's right. When they have the famine in, in Jerusalem, he sends money back to support them. So they're more than happy to take the money he brings back to Jerusalem while simultaneously no. criticizing his ministry to yeah. the Gentiles. Yeah. Well, and it's ethnic as well, which makes Absolutely. us uncomfortable. It's like, right. wait a minute. Wait a minute. They're racist? Yeah, no, they're racist too. <laughs> Huge. Right. The nations, not meaning not Israelites, meaning not circumcised. Well, and, that, and then Paul is not a real Jew because of his Roman you know, Correct, upbringing right. and affiliation. Yeah. Right. So that's kind of, in my opinion, then that's the subtext of this verse and what, you know, what follows it. Not only the dispute here about Titus being circumcised, but then what we'll read in the next episode about his dispute with Peter. Yeah. Wow. So let's dive in. This word compelled, Titus who was with me was compelled to be circumcised. The word compelled states the conclusion of the entire conference. The Gentiles were not compelled to be circumcised. So not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised. But why not even Titus? What about Titus? Mm -hmm. why, why would Paul write that about Titus? Out of respect for the fathers, circumcision would be tolerated for a time until they were strengthened in the faith, but not as conditional for receiving righteousness and also out of love for the weak, so as not to offend them until they grew in faith and matured. It would have seemed something very rare and improper to so suddenly abandon the law and the traditions of the fathers, which had been given to this people by God with such great glory. Hmm. Thousands of years of beautiful tradition from Moses to Sandy Koufax. <laughs> I was thinking too, I mean, this is Luther's uh, statement um, to, who's the, who's the guy he left in Wittenberg? And then Luther has to write back to him about um, his liturgical reforms when he's in Luther's in the in the Coburn Karlstadt. Yeah, Karlstadt. Talking to Karlstadt is like, look, Karlstadt, you didn't have the right you didn't have the wrong idea. You had the right idea. We're you know, we're gonna do some liturgical reforms. It's just right. it's too soon. You're right. too fast. You haven't given them the chance. They're not even they don't the people don't even know the gospel yet. <laughs> yeah. You know, you need to preach the gospel to them. Keep wearing the vestments, keep doing right. the, doing the stuff that you don't you it isn't necessary. Absolutely. But but you've got weak consciences here. Yeah. Right. Well, here by by way of comparison, then Luther takes years to catechize the church in Wittenberg about baptism, mm -hmm, right? And the changes, the quote unquote innovations that they are going to make to baptism. Well, he doesn't do it all at once, right? He does. He does a couple stages of reform. He doesn't do it all at once. Eventually, he does say, "Okay, it's been five, six, seven years. You had enough time to adjust. Now." We're going to stop with all of this extra stuff, and we're just going to focus on what makes baptism baptism. Extreme ownership. 
extreme ownership. But at the same time, you see in the present tense to use the present crisis as as a lot of people want to frame the pandemic mm -hmm. as, mm -hmm. the church freaks out in under six weeks, actually in under four weeks. A lot of people in different churches freaked out about being shut down and not being able to gather for corporate worship. And like right. you said, we can't carry on with our traditions. We can't maintain the status quo. What are we going to do? And you see the conflict erupt both behind the scenes right. and on social media between churches in church bodies and, and so forth about, well, we're doing this, but you're doing that. And we disagree with you. And how could you do this? And why are you justifying that? What's the last part that's the problem? When, when right. you say, well, why are you doing that? And justify yeah. yourself. Like, now's not the time for that. And Luther is saying the same thing to your point, though. That's why I bring it up for a way of comparison. He's saying to Carl Stott, listen, there is a time and a place for what you are promoting and what you want to do. One, the way that you're doing it, very destructive right. to the church. Not helpful. Two, smashing windows. Yeah. Yeah, smashing <laughs> windows, tearing down altars, smashing statuary, throwing out vestments, and so forth. I'm not saying that those things don't need, we don't need to ask, you know, and I'm not saying that we don't need to ask why mm -hmm. we vest or why we have the statuary or those stained glass windows. I'm not saying that. However, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. And also try and see these things in terms of eternity, not in terms of the present moment. You mean, you mean they actually probably don't matter that much? Probably not at all. <laughs> no. Right. So you can receive them, you know, with the empty hand of faith and just say, mm -hmm. you know, I could take or leave it. And it's right. not the point. Let's, let's right. keep the focus where it needs to be. Right. And like he points out, receiving righteousness has nothing to do with circumcision. However, as a tradition, for the sake of their conscience, mm -hmm. if they choose to be circumcised, great. They can be circumcised up to a point. It, it seems odd to me. You know, why would this be such a big, big deal? Well, like it would have to be communal, a community situation where you look over there and go, all those people over there in that housing block are mm -hmm. Jewish. Right. They're all circumcised. Or maybe it's the fact that they, again, dress differently, especially the Orthodox Jews. Right. They conducted themselves differently than the rest of the Gentile population. But there's there's a private nature to the tradition is what I was trying yes, to suggest. absolutely. Because it's covered absolutely. up. Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's not like Gentiles are rushing into the synagogue. Yeah. You had God-fearing Gentiles, but they weren't allowed to participate fully in the rites of the synagogue. But in the, they wanted to convert. They did have to get circumcised. That's right. That's right. But that was also a very long process, too. Right. But it, And it wasn't a public rite, though. No, it wasn't. No. Oof, so that's, that's, that's that'd why... Be, it, that'd be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's the account... Where was that? In the, Was it in the wilderness when they, when they all got circumcised? Yes. Yeah. And you think all the men... Oh, gosh... Yes, no, bad time. That's a bad <laughs> Let's time. Let's not think about this one. No. But this is the point. Righteousness is the forgiveness of sin, as mm -hmm. Paul talks about in the first opening verses of his letter, which Luther covers in the first chapter of his commentary. So righteousness comes through the forgiveness of sin. Circumcision does not get for us, gain for us the forgiveness of sin. It was a covenant made with Abraham that pointed to the New Testament pointed to the quote-unquote new covenant in Jesus' blood. But baptisms replace circumcision. Right. And, and circumcision is only going to be a problem when it when they make it a problem. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you just keep, well, today, I mean, people are circumcised and it's not a problem, right? Right. We just don't make a deal out of it. That's a good point, actually. And we've talked about this a couple of episodes ago about the power of symbol mm -hmm. and right. tradition notably tradition, at least in my experience, is tied hand in glove with symbolism. Right. And traditions in and of themselves are benign. They're traditions. And they can be for good or for ill, depending on how they are celebrated, how they observed, so forth and so on. But the power of the symbol that is the tradition, the doing of the carrying out of the rites and the rituals that are incorporated into that tradition, there's power in that. Right. And you and I see this all the time because we serve a traditional church body and we're in the upper Midwest. There's <laughs> traditional yeah, the, people, yeah. Traditional people going all the way back to the immigration. Like in my area, this goes all the way back to the 1830s and the traditions of the first groups of immigrants that came over here and settled down. And then those traditions have carried over in one way, shape, or form to the present tense. Yeah, my, somehow. my family, uh, one of our family stories is when my uncle decided to introduce no-till farming back in like, who knows when, 70s or something. 
and how offensive this was. <laughs> you hippie. <laughs> well, exactly. Like, and now, of course, it's common, but um, yeah. But at the time, it's like, no, you're going. It, you really. He was going against tradition. Yeah. It's like we have this. We have this tried way of doing it, and it, it usually works fine. And then you're gonna you're gonna come along and say that we don't need to go until the farm till it right until the spring. We're like what? Right. What? This is make no. You know. Well, and also by way of comparison, Jesus. Every time tradition is brought up in the Gospels, except for one instance, Jesus has something pejorative to say about the traditions of the Jewish leaders, or yeah. the, Jew, uh, the traditions of the of the Jews. The fathers have kind of a uh, negative yeah. connotation attached to it. Your father, yeah, your father. Right, exactly, yeah, your fathers. Because they're weaponizing their traditions mm -hmm. yeah. to say, well, you're not, we don't have to listen to you, you're not an authority, and other people shouldn't be listening to you either, because you're not following the traditions of our fathers. Right, so circumcision only becomes a problem when it becomes um, a, not not an accepted practice, but a normalizing standard or something, right? Right. Or, well, and don't argue with the dude who was there with your fathers <laughs> as a witness to what they were doing. Jesus was there with yeah. your fathers. He knows what they actually were doing. And that's the point that he takes, I think, with the Jewish religious leaders is, you're saying one thing, but you've you've twisted up and changed the traditions of your fathers to suit your desires right. and your need to be self-righteous. Did your fathers practice those things? Yes. Did they do them in faith? Ah, there's the distinction. Right, right. And you don't have to necessarily, it's interesting what Luther says, you don't have to abandon the law. You yeah. do You do have to abandon the law for righteousness. Correct. That's the. That's what the gospel right. brings. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the disciples continued to go to the temple. They continued to go to synagogue. Until they couldn't anymore. Until they couldn't anymore, exactly. It, and they didn't abandon the traditions of their fathers. They kept singing the same thing, which is fine because yeah. it was the Psalms, but... <laughs> right. Yeah. But nonetheless, they were, like you said, they were driven out of the temple, driven out of the synagogues because of their proclamation of Christ. Hey, we're, we're good with you coming as long as you don't preach in the name of Jesus. Right. Well, okay, at that point, yeah, no, uh, we can't. Right. <laughs> which I think is such a great litmus test then for one, passive righteousness and mm -hmm. the works of the flesh in that... You don't have to abandon the, these traditions. However, the way that you test them is to proclaim the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. You know, Jesus is the name alone for the forgiveness of sins. Right. And then see what happens to the people <laughs> who adhere to those traditions and right. how they react to the preaching of Jesus. Right. Does it stand up, you know, or does it mm -hmm. create a conflict? Right. I mean, Jesus does say, I've come to divide the house. Mm -hmm. Families will be divided because of me. Because of my, that's what Luther, and that what Luther did with his liturgical reforms. Like, for example, the doctrine of penance. You mm -hmm. know, you put it up against forgiveness of sins freely in Christ's sake, and you're like, oh, no, these two things don't go together. Yeah, it doesn't carry water. No, I saw I saw an article about um, the Catholic diocese in Chicago reopening, and they mentioned they have they have like a new newish thing that came out of Vatican II. I forgot about it. Mm -hmm. What do they call it? The Sacrament of Reconciliation is what they're calling. Yeah, it. and the and the old priest, wine skins. Well, I know, but the priest did say that, uh, you know, you can't go to confession because of social distancing and all this. It's like confessionals have social distancing built into right. them, but whatever. Um, <laughs> the uh, I'm talking about the booth, you know, the boxes you've seen on TV. Yeah. 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 Um, but he said, you know, that, that you have forgiveness in Jesus. I'm like, what? And you need for something they make all these distinctions from aquinas and uh, of course I was, they do i was like what he was talking about like different orders of sin and different kinds mm -hmm. of forgiveness of course and I'm like all right the nuancing here is probably not helpful in uh, the chicago tribune but <laughs> well that's that's literally though the difference between the old wineskin and the new wine oh, and I why see. the new wine burst the old wineskins because the old wineskins you you can recognize when they're being brought out to be used because they have conditions. Yeah, constraints, restraints. They always have constraints and restraints Borders, and conditions and boxes. equivocations. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Whereas the gospel says, there are none. I got none. No, this you're forgiven. This is just a flood. Yeah, yeah, you're forgiven. But what about this? No, we can't use those old wineskins. Right. Those are dry, brittle things. They'll burst. So that's where circumcision will fall down, as if right. it becomes like, no, you have to be. Oh. Yeah. No. Yeah, it's, it's an either <laughs> or statement. Whereas mm -hmm. Paul's basically saying, listen, you can do both. So long as you hold them in tension. Right. And well, and, and keep, keep, actually do restrain the law. Yeah. Keep the law in its place. The gospel yeah. is right. free, but, but the law has its, only has its purpose. Right.
Yeah. And maybe that's the thing that rubs us raw as old Adam sinners is that the gospel has no limits, but the law does. Mm-hmm. Because at least in my experience, that's usually the way I see people argue is that the law has no limits, but the gospel does. Yeah, the law applies to every aspect of your life, mm-hmm. which in a sense it does, right? Yeah. But that there's a time where the law is never to be silent, <laughs> whereas the gospel, <laughs> right. you keep the gospel hidden until, um, you know, un- until you feel really sorry about, you know, what the law <laughs> right. has revealed. And then you bring yes. the gospel out. And it seems, well, I, certainly in Paul, it's the opposite. Right. The gospel predominates. It's always present. And, th- and there's a time where the law actually has to shut, shut its mouth. Mm-hmm. And that's in the face of the when gospel. When it meets Christ. Yeah. So, therefore, Luther writes, Paul did not reject circumcision, circumcision as a practice to be condemned. And neither by word nor by deed did he require the Jews to abandon it. In chapter 7 of his first letter to the Corinthians, he said, Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become circumcised. Uncircumcised, sorry. Yeah, good luck with that anyway. First, Yeah, exactly. Get uncircumcised. See how that works for you? First Corinthians 7, 18, by the way. However, he rejected circumcision as something necessary for righteousness. He showed that the fathers were not justified because of their circumcision. Romans 4, 11. For them, it was only a sign, a seal of righteousness by which they testified that they had expressed their faith. Even so, those believing Jews who were still weak and retained a zeal for the law, when they heard that circumcision was not necessary for righteousness, could not accept it, no matter how it was presented. Mm. They could only understand that Paul said that it did not profit them anything and that it was reproachable. The Jews, weak in faith, had a great deal of affection for the doctrine of the law, so the false apostles sang its praises. As a consequence, they were able to turn the people against Paul in order to discredit his doctrine, if possible, in all of its totality. Mm. Mm. Similar today, we do not reject the fasts and other religious exercises as reproachable. However, we teach that by these things we do not obtain the remission of sins. But when people hear this, they accuse us of speaking against good works. Man, I really wish I could relate with this. This This, No, that never happens. This is so strange what he's talking about. I don't <laughs> don't understand. Oh, there's the hum. Tongue in cheek. Sarcasm. My furnace just kicked in. <laughs> Dear listeners, if you hear hum in, in Pastor Riley's mic, he is aware of it. I am aware. It's Minnesota and it's spring, which means yesterday it was 70 and today it's 40. <laughs> so the heater's on. And so the furnace just kicks in randomly. I'm sorry. It's the rumble underneath me too. But um, I think this is a key point, right? Because he says it, right? If you want to get circumcised, knock yourself out right. if you're Jewish. Yeah, that's cultural Judaism, right? It's cultural Judaism. If you want, well, here's the thing, right? And he talks about this in the small catechism when he talks about the Lord's Supper. Mm-hmm. If you want to fast on Saturday night to prepare for Sunday morning, knock yourself out. But it doesn't actually make you worthy to come to the Lord's Supper. And you're not actually well prepared to come to the Lord's Supper if you think fasting does that for you. So the same thing like you see with... Um, the the well the sacrament that takes circumcision's place baptism right right when, when the the church in like say in Europe Western Europe gets attached to the to the state and then everybody by virtue I mean you become a citizen by being baptized mm-hmm. right and th- there's this like de facto um, what if you're baptized then you're saved which right. is what the scriptures teach but divorced of faith now, right like, wait a minute no, that baptism, is magic. Bab- yeah, it's, it's, like, it's magic, magic. I got my kid baptized. You know, like, right. That's, n- it's difficult, right, to talk about <laughs> right. this because you're like. Well, a couple things. One, just because you receive a gift mm-hmm. doesn't mean that you have to, one, accept it, or two, use it for what is in- it is intended for. Right. We do this all the time. You take the gift, you look at it, you throw it in the garbage, you walk away. Does that mean you get to enjoy the benefits of the gift you've received? No. By your own choosing, you chose to abandon the gift right. rather than enjoy it. Well, if you've been adopted and brought into a household and then you never, and then you run away from your right. new home, just to use, you know, the Bible's illustration of what it is to be baptized, mm-hmm. that, that, well, it, it, if you put it in those words, it doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that? That doesn't make any sense. Right. You've been, and, or if you want to use the strong and stronger man, right? Where you, yeah. where the demons cast out. Yeah, you've been set free. You've been set free. Why do you run home? Well, why do you leave the house empty? Right. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you do no. that? But that's what, what we do. Same thing with the sacrament of the altar, right? It's the Lord's Supper. Just to say, 
Well, what's what's necessary? Luther's careful. It's faith in yeah. these words. Right. It's like receiving Given the sacrament is a good thing. Right. With faith. Fasting. Good discipline. Mm-hmm. Preparation. Great discipline. Does it does it prepare you to receive righteousness? No. No. No human work can prepare you to receive the forgiveness of sins. That's mm-hmm. why it's a gift. Yeah. Also, though, a, a deeper point that mm-hmm. I wanted to draw out before we end this episode is, this is why you and I have talked about before, not all sacraments are the same. This is a key point. We've talked oh, about yeah. St. Augustine, where St. Augustine flattens the curve and says, whatever God's word is attached to, that's a sacrament. Yeah. Well, God attaches his word to your foreskin, if you're <laughs> Abraham, which probably makes modern Christians very uncomfortable to consider, but that's how our God rolls. And he's not a prude. And if we equate the the sacrament, the sign of circumcision, to be equal with the sign of baptism, mm-hmm. well, then we can practice both. We see this as a as a more benign example when Christian churches celebrate the Seder meal oh, on yeah. Friday. These are not the same things. No, nope. the Seder meal and the Lord's Supper are not the same. They appear to be the same because they're celebrated. There's some similarities. That's what I was going to say. The similarities are optical. That is, they're celebrated similarly because Jesus gathers together for the Passover, they get the lamb, they get well, the wine, they sit on the table. Right? It's contextual. Yeah. And yet, it's not, the, it's not the event, it's not the tradition. It's that's the, the words. Thing. It's the words. This is exactly. my body given for you. Yeah. Exactly. So we look at the optics and go, well, this is the Seder meal, and so we should observe the Seder meal, and we should have a, a Jewish person come in and explain the Seder meal to us. Versus, no, Jesus, his words institute a new testament in his blood Mm -hmm. yeah otherwise if we just celebrate the seder meal as if well we undo the entire new testament and what makes us uncomfortable there then is that the the practices are somewhat free that surround the word as long as as long as they don't contradict the word and and here we're dealing with conscience which is Mm -hmm. what they're dealing with with uh, circumcision here luther brought this out to say you know there are weaker consciences there are those people who will see like say for example um, some practice that you have attached to sacrament of, say, mm-hmm. baptism, you know, the way you conduct yeah. baptism, and it's offensive to them. It, it doesn't mean that you intend to offend. It doesn't mean right. that, you know, I don't know what it, what this might be. Maybe you hold the baby up like um, like Simba and Lion King, right, and parade the baby <laughs> up and down the, the aisle. Right, the circle of life. But, yeah. And like, why is why is he doing that? To me, that would be offensive. I'd be just like, well, one, sure. I'd just be like, it's utterly unnecessary, right? Um, Especially if someone up in the choir loft hits the hits the tape, and we all of a sudden hear the soundtrack. Yeah, well, no, that definitely be a problem. But I understand you're presenting <laughs> the child to the congregation, you know. Um, uh, but, but that distracts from the word. It does exactly. Well, and a lot of the right <laughs> distracts from the word. All, well, yeah. even as we have it now, one of our uh, one of our fathers in the faith, uh, Pastor Leia, mm, right. talks about in our tradition. You don't have confirmation on Sunday morning because it's pomp, it's parade, it's all about the the spectacle, and it takes away from you do it in the home with the parents. It, well, you do it on Thursday night for him. Uh, privately with just the elders and the families of the confirmands in the church. Well, you're supposed to make them sit up at the front and answer 184 questions. They do. Them. They do. Back in Leah's <laughs> day, they did. Yeah, they but did. But then they, got, they also got to ask questions of the elders in the congregation, though. Uh, when I brought that up, it shot down that whole conversation <laughs> immediately. <laughs> what, we adults. have to get examined, too? Yeah, for three hours. And, <laughs> yeah, so a six-hour examination time. Think Ouch. about that. Ouch. But his point was... This is a tradition. Confirmation is a tradition. It's not the divine service. It's not a sacrament. And it has no place in the divine service then because there's only one reason to gather on Sunday morning for worship, and that's to receive Christ and him crucified for the forgiveness of sin. Anything that detracts from that for Leah must be taken out of the divine service and put somewhere else. Again, he's not saying it's bad. He's just saying it does. It has no place in the divine service because it's not Christ. That was our last episode we talked about. I think I mentioned apostolic preaching You know, from the book of Acts. And there mm-hmm. isn't there isn't another example of that that is what apostolic that's what the divine service is that's the right. preaching of the gospel is for forgiveness mm-hmm. of sins in Christ Jesus that's it and right. you don't find them I mean they bring in the Old Testament as type and shadow right mm-hmm. you know here's Christ from mm-hmm. the Old Testament and yeah that's which is terrific that's what we do and we or as you said you apply the law you know yeah lawfully um, yeah lawfully to the to their life. And and then the gospel is preached, and the rest right. the rest has to kind of just get out of the way, right? Which is another great point that in at least the Lutheran tradition we draw the distinction between the Roman Catholic 
apostolic succession, which is Peter and the Pope. Oh, yes. But in the Lutheran tradition, which I don't really think a lot of Protestants even regard mm -hmm. anymore, is apostolic succession is the proclamation of the gospel from it's one doctrine. preacher to the next. Yep. Yeah, it's doctrine. So if you ever wondered, well, how can I test whether or not we're a part of the apostolic church or a part of the apostolic succession of the church in the, in the biblical sense, well, is the gospel of Jesus Christ preach? Hmm. If so, you're good to go. And something like circumcision is just not a big deal. It shouldn't be. It's, it's not. Any more than any other tradition is a sign, but that's all it is. It's a sign. It's like we talked about with atonement mm -hmm. theories. And just let those, let those things stay in their place, right? Right. The there's, it's fine to discuss atonement theories, but in the pulpit, I need you to preach the actual atonement <laughs> to me. Forgive <laughs> sins, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so likewise, atonement theories, nice tradition. Fun to argue about different, you know, different ways that we could, uh, what do you want to say, explain, teach, lenses, atonement. yeah, yeah, perspectives, yeah. But at the end of the day, I don't need your perspective. I need the observable facts. Mm -hmm. He died. He shed his blood. He was abandoned by God. He descended into hell. These kinds of things. But as Luther points out, when people hear this, they accuse us of speaking against good works. Yeah, all you ever do is preach the gospel. You're promoting sin by preaching the gospel apart from works. Okay. <laughs> Pastor, why can't you put more application at the end of your sermon? You know, stuff for us to do. Well, what's interesting is, as we just said, we do good works, but the good works are those that we've been appointed to do. Right. To give, right? To preach, to teach. Yeah. Your job is to, to die. Yeah. As a Christian, you have one job, die. Yeah, and our job to, is, I guess, to kill you. <laughs> kill you. And you think to yourself, well, that's kind of morbid. Well, yeah. no, actually, you're dying all the time mm -hmm. in your vocations. That's where the cross is laid on you. Yeah. That's where you're sacrificed. You just don't either A, want to acknowledge it, or B, it hasn't been revealed to you how the death is happening. Yeah. And ultimately, then, what you and I, we want to do is choose how we die. This is why the hero's journey is so important for us. Why, again, symbols are so important to us, because they give us a sense of place and meaning and definition and identity. Well, and ultimately so that we control. Can, and then ultimately control and choice. I choose my own destiny. You hear this in professional sports. We're in control of our destiny. That's literally contradictory. Like, you're literally contradicting yourself. That's ultimately at the source of the conflict. More COVID stuff here, but you know, between the different approaches of, you know, of, of governments worldwide and, and even mm -hmm. among our states, is that some would would choose to die in a different way, right? We're going to delay our death as long as possible. I don't right. want to get COVID-19 until next year, for example. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I'm going to get it. I'm, I just want to delay it as long as possible for right. X, Y, Z reasons, right? Mm -hmm. And others are like, look, you're going to die either way. Right. Is it worth really jeopardizing the future of, of, the, of our economy, of, you know, your children's welfare for... Right to delay your death now. Right. And that sounds, I mean, it sounds callous and sounds terrible. It's just, but it's also real, right? <laughs> I, I don't find it to be cold or callous at all, actually. It's like, no, you're always, there's always a compromise. There's no. Well, it's like I said it yesterday in the meditation, we're all born with a pre-existing condition. Yeah, it's called true. mortality. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you're going to die. Well, and you can make choices in, in how sure. you relate to that reality, right? right? But what we call life is literally avoiding death. Most of the time. Most people, well, name one thing that we do that isn't an attempt to avoid death. Um, binge drinking? Again, same thing. You're just trying to avoid, you're trying to choose it. You're choosing it, right? Oh, avoid the death that the Lord has for you and instead. Exactly. Uh, right. I got you. Cho right. Choose your own adventure. <laughs> it is. It literally choose your own adventure and addiction. It's but even all in, in the, the same way. <laughs> right. It's like, because at least you can say in those, in that situation in addiction, well, but I'm choosing to live. This is how I choose to live my life. And I'm not going to let other people tell me how to live. And mm. I like to do this. And I want to do this. And I like the people that I, I have, be, you know, that are a part of my social circles. And therefore, this is, you know, I'm actually living by going out and drinking and using and living free. Yeah. And, and from the outside, yeah, you objectively, you're looking and observing and going, dude, you do realize you're a slave, right? Like you're, you, and, but that's the point is that, like Bob Dylan's saying, you got to serve somebody. Everybody's got to serve somebody. Everybody's got to serve somebody. And at the end of the day, we all think we have choices about who we serve and what traditions we adopt or put down how we're going to be obedient or disobedient to different traditions, like you said, different authorities or powers and so forth. 
But at the end of the day, we all have to stand before the judgment seat. Yep. And actually, the only people that won't have to answer for their sin are those who have already been baptized. It's true. It's good times. So yeah, you can get circumcised if you want to, but then you're still going to have to stand before the judgment seat at the last day and go, I honestly, I thought at the time it was a great choice. I thought it was a good choice. I thought I was making the right choice at the time. But in the, in the end, the only thing that's yeah. going to cover me is the blood of Jesus. Right, yeah. right. It's Jesus at the last day going, stop talking. <laughs> You're baptized. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I hear you. Uh, can we just move on? Okay. Right, that's, exactly. Nope, that's I, got, I literally nope, got nope, billions nope. of other people to cover today, so if we could just move this along. Like, I love you. Just <laughs> keep moving. Keep moving. You're forgiven. It. That's right. And we're walking. And we're walking. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So we'll end the circumcision conversation there. First part, part one, anyway. Yeah. Part one of the circumcision. Then we'll come back and we'll have a fun conversation about what Peter thinks about this whole matter of circumcision. Paul and Peter. And, yeah, Peter and Paul. Paul and Peter, the and Righteous Brothers <laughs> 1.0. It's a Hatfield and McCoy. Really, it is, yeah. Yeah, so thank you for everything that you do. Thanks for all the feedback. Thanks for playing the home game with us the past several episodes during Quarantine Fever. And we'll see you next episode for, well, what we think will be a brand new episode. It'll feel that way. If you hear... If you hear this conversation a second time, just acknowledge and move on. <laughs> we'll see you. Peace. Have you wondered about this? I mean, do you like walk up to somebody and just say, like, are you circumcised? And mm -hmm. are they just supposed to whip it out and show you? I, right. I've wondered about this. I mean, they have public baths, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. But how would you know? But well, I was going to say, but a Jew would not inter interact, at least an Orthodox Jew would not interact with Gentiles in a bathhouse for no. several no, reasons. So how do they even know? Right.